Please welcome. The Soviet Union 28 years ago, but still poor. Uh, we are poorer than Mon Mongolia. Our GDP per capita, the nominal one, is uh, a bit more than 1,000. So quite poor. But we are also another democracy in that region, the only democracy or the closest democracy to Mongolia maybe <laughs> from that side because we, are, we border with China, with Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. So uh, we are proud of at least having uh, some freedom, political freedom. So our goal is to promote economic freedom and uh, individual freedom in our country. One of the key um, directions of what we do is also freedom of movement. And I, will, I would like to share something about this uh, with regard to the reform that we were able to promote. And uh, I'll share that information with you. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, yeah, I help to promote economic reforms in my country. I have uh, many years of experience in working in media too, and uh, owned a media company, uh, online news source. And also I have uh, experience in politics and running different campaigns. Uh, so this also gives me the understanding of the political structure and how we can promote reforms from very different perspectives from what the president thinks and from what the members of parliament think in my country or the media or the civil society. Because I have worked with different uh, people from those uh, bodies. And uh, my topic is about advancing economic reforms through the government and the parliament. When we first tried in 2009 to promote uh, reforms, uh, we were mostly working on discussions and educating the people because not many people understood the concepts of freedom. Uh, and of course, we, we wrote articles, but that part was, on the one hand, we did a great job. On the other hand, we missed the key part. We did not work with uh, policymakers at that moment. So many topics uh, that we raised were discussed only among the public and not going forward. While past years we've been also adding here uh, the work with uh, the parliament, with the government, uh, sometimes with the president's office. So this forces our uh, reforms that we promote. Um, and uh, here, this is, this is what the case that I would like to share. And before coming here, just a few topics why freedom of movement is uh, very relevant here too. Uh, when we started our work 10 years ago, uh, the Central Asian Free Market Institute, one of the key topics was the Propiska system, which is the Soviet registration system to control the internal migration. Uh, so we raised that issue, it has been since then liberalized, so uh, people are freer to move and uh, the government does not uh, control uh, the movement within the country. The other initiative that we were successful to, um, dealing with uh, was the visa-free regime. Uh, if some other countries around the world introduced visa-free regime for other countries, uh, unilaterally too, then our region was not. Uh, mainly we would have visa-free regime for Cuba, North Korea, and uh, uh, I don't remember, Vietnam, um, like those uh, post-communist uh, blocs. Um, but in 2012, the uh, visa-free regime, uh, visa-free policy law was accepted and right now we have like over 60 uh, countries uh, working still to advance the number, but we were uh, the first one in the Central Asian region to do so. And I'm very proud that Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan are repeating this experience based on our experience. So this uh, domino 
uh, policy exchange in that region is beneficial when we can promote good reforms. So visa free regime also about freedom of movement, freedom of trade, uh, otherwise no businesses, no investment would come to Kyrgyzstan. And then another topic was the open skies policy because we are a landlocked country with a little more population than Mongolia. Um, not very interesting because the market is not big for investments. So, and also we are, we mainly import goods from China while we get money from our uh, labor migrants who work in different parts of the world, mainly in Russia. So that's the whole economy that uh, we have. Of course, we have uh, some gold mining companies and uh, agriculture and services. So here, the idea was that if previously airlines, uh, if they wanted to fly through Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan is located in the heart, in the center of the Eurasian continent. So Southeast Asia and, the U and Europe can be connected through us, and that's the trend of airlines. And uh, we said, okay, we, don't, we want to remove the bureaucracy and corruption here, because in many countries, airlines would first need bilateral agreement between countries, for example, the United States, yes, it signs open skies agreements, but this is based on bilateral agreement. You should have the agreement between governments. Um, and uh, when you get that, you still ha have to deal with uh, civic aviation authorities in that country to get the permission, uh, to get your roads, and sometimes, or in ma many cases, they even try to control your fare. Uh, how much does your ticket cost? How many people will be uh, flying? How often? And etc. So we, w we wanted to remove all of this so that the airlines would mainly contact the airport and uh, deal, make business with the airport, and the airport would be the leading uh, company from the country. This initiative actually was started in 2012, uh, more than six years ago. Uh, at that moment, in 2012 and 13, we worked with the Ministry of Economy, our team, uh, and we were trying to promote this policy, this law, through the Ministry of Economy, because their main goal is to bring like more fr freer markets and more reforms, less regulations. Uh, but the ministry was not that strong. And when these uh, local private and uh, government-owned airlines, they started, we, we believe that they bribed uh, the politicians too. We failed this at that moment in 2013. At that moment, we, what we did, we, just, we didn't only say that we need this policy. We made a big research on why we need it, how we could make it, and we also prepared the draft law, the, uh, the draft bill, so that the parliament would approve it and the president would sign it. So we lost it at that moment. In 2017, there was a young prime minister, and uh, our friends also reached him, uh, and he said, okay, uh, let's force open skies policy. But what he did is that he said, okay, the Ministry of Transportation and the, authority, the Civil Aviation Authority should develop this plan and should develop this law. So when they called their law the Open Skies Law, it was not the Open Skies. They wrote that they want to control everything. Like, yes, they would fly, it would be the Open Skies. Uh, by the way, the Open Skies is one, like, when the airplane from one country comes to my country, lands there, some passengers or cargo would go out and some will go in, and then it would fly to another country. Um, this is the fifth and sixth uh, level of freedom of air. Uh, but the government, when we said they, they could pr uh, prepare this, they prepared the closed air, closed skies policy, and we, we went against it. So last year, like a, a year after this, they still had, the government still had their uh, draft law. This was registered in the parliament for discussions and for voting. 
and uh, we could not um, we could not influence them. Uh, but what we did, we did another big research. We prepared our own bill, our own law, draft law, and um, we we worked mainly in the beginning. We we have chosen one member of parliament who we trusted, and then he he united uh, other twenty. We have one hundred twenty members of parliament, so twenty members of parliament, they became co-initiators of the law that we prepared. So the parliament had two draft laws, and only because of this, and because we started also working actively in the media, and uh, calling the government's draft law the closed skies law, not the open skies law, we had enormous amount of debates. I think I personally presented, like I don't know, of in the Prime Minister's office 10 times um, what we need and why their uh, policy is not the open skies policy. And in the parliament also, like for each member of parliament, we had to talk. Uh, it would be like in the morning I would go to them, they, there would be 10 or 20 members, and they would say, okay, now we trust you. And then in the evening they would start calling and saying like, hey, this airline called me and they say that this will kill all our industry. Hey, this says that the, uh, the terrorists will fly if we accept this. Uh, so uh, we had to deal with very different information and especially our intelligence agencies, which we believe not fully belongs to our country. Um, they also didn't want the open skies and they would say, I don't know, like, Terror, military aircraft would fly to Kyrgyzstan, which is not about what we were promoting. But anyways, uh, it took us in 2018 uh, more than half a year only to convince the members of parliament. And uh, when we knew already that the majority of the parliament would support us, uh, the positions of the government weakened. And uh, at that moment, we, we, we came back again to the government. And uh, the Prime Minister was asking, uh, so we had an event. There would be members of Parliament and the government office and ministers. And before the start, uh, I, I, I had this private conversation with the Prime Minister and he said, I don't know what to do. Uh, what should I say? And uh, the only recommendation was that withdraw your uh, bill and uh, support the, the Parliament. So that day, the Prime Minister supported the Parliament's bill. And uh, luckily, it was approved in three readings. And after a little more than a month, the president signed. And the signature was, uh, the president signed this bill that we prepared um, in late January. Uh, so we, this bill works only four months right now. We don't have enormous like, success to, uh, to brag about, like saying we've got 200 airlines, no, uh, because uh, we, there is also a provisional period of six months uh, when all other like instructions and little policies should be changed and uh, should be brought uh, to what the uh, new air code says. So they should have, and here the problem is that the Ministry of Transport and the Civil Aviation Agency uh, they said, okay, the bill is accepted, but they tried not to work, not to do anything, not to change any instructions. So now, the Prime Minister, uh, we again, through the member of the parliament, we called the Prime Minister. Prime Minister again formed an interagency working group, uh, where I'm the member of. And now, we are not, on, we not only help to uh, to advance this law, now we are part of implementation because otherwise uh, these bureaucrats are not going to implement it that way. But this is also good on the other side when we got involved in implementation because right now what our demands and what we wrote in their plan is that uh, we, br we are bringing like uh, transparency. Every contact of the airline with that authority should be immediately publicized. 
Uh, otherwise, they would not do that. This was not in the law. Uh, so now we are bringing them more and more requirements so that this uh, sector became transparent, less corrupt, less bureaucratic. Of course, we wanted to fully remove it. Um, uh, but uh, I think we are trying. So this is, um, this is what, uh, what happened with this initiative right now. And um, it is just a few words that I wanted to say is, uh, for example, for us it was also, uh, we had two options, right? Uh, we could either force the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Civil Aviation Agency, so that they actively went out and signed bilateral agreements. This would be like bilateral free trade agreements. Uh, but we chose uh, the unilateral one. So the law states any country with no agreement can, f uh, like the airlines registered in those countries, can fly uh, to Kyrgyzstan and they don't, don't need the license and uh, permission. Uh, this also gives me a hope that the Liberty International Conference can be one year conducted in Bishkek. Um, so maybe uh, finalizing my presentation and then like uh, giving the mic to you. Um, just some lessons learned from our perspective. Of course, Kyrgyzstan is a different country than many other countries, and the political structure and uh, everything works differently. Uh, but for us, it was really, this fight took us six years. Um, but the first lesson, of course, like, uh, don't quit, keep fighting. And uh, we did that. And finally, we could have, uh, we, we, we got what we wanted, at least from the legal perspective. Uh, the second is that um, th th these uh, different uh, bodies, like, uh, it's not enough only to work with the media. I, in my understanding is that the lawyer that writes the bill, he decides how should it be. Uh, because every time these members of parliament would call me and uh, the, the lawyer, our lawyer, um, and asking like, can we change this term? Can we change this word? And we would say, no, you cannot change it. And uh, we would have our arguments. But the base was, uh, as, as the base of this law uh, was developed by us, we had this authority uh, to fight against any modifications. Uh, but if we didn't do that, but we only, on the ideal side, like on the, on the side of ideas and public debate supported this, we would probably have less influence on, on the law, on how it looks like, on the phrase, uh, for example, the definition of, of the uh, fifth level of freedom, uh, air freedom, is ours is better than the, uh, than the definition of International Association of Air Transport. Uh, because uh, we just changed it a little bit so that it looked even more <laughs> freer and uh, more libertarian, as we would say. Um, so this is uh, the second lesson for us, like who prepares the documents. It's like who, who, pays that, uh, who pays the bill that orders the music, but here, like who writes the bill, <laughs> he can control the rest. Um, that's it. Thank you. And have a terrific time. Questions? Um, this is uh, fascinating. Um, I'm very pleased to say that we were able to visit you some years ago. Yeah. And you were a lone person, sort of actually getting arrested from time to time for your rebellion. And, and yeah. I'm great. so pleased to see this uh, Central Asia Free Market Institute. Please tell us how you started that. Who's the supporters of it? I mean, do you have people in the business community or something that are supporting it? And who, who are your, who's your staff and members that are helping you? Um, we started 10 years ago the Central Asian Free Market Institute, thanks to Atlas Network's uh, Tom Palmer's active involvement. And um, 
in the first years, I think, we were very active and our, like, the scale of our work was very wide. Um, in part, last recent years, I can say we are very weak. So right now we are trying to restart, relaunch it. Uh, because that expertise that we have right now, it gives us more hope that we can promote reforms easily and faster. Uh, because I also had this uh, time out uh, from CAFME, from Central Asian Free Market Institute, and that gave me other expertise of how to work with the parliament, how to work with the government, how to work with the media. So now I am going to bring all of this expertise uh, back to CAFME. Uh, while with regard to who helps overall, uh, because in the beginning also we were promoting the discussion of ideas. There, there, are, there are groups of people who really support uh, our ideas. And um, there are some business associations or uh, there are some other groups of people, like from uh, my groups too, and, uh, and we just work together, not limiting ourselves from the cooperation. Uh, and um, here it was also very interesting, we were in this uh, regard, with regard to the Open Skies, the, uh, the group who supports uh, free markets, uh, I mean like, uh, who supports private businesses were fighting with our crony uh, private businesses uh, because they were against it, they wanted the monopoly and they were saying, oh, they will go bankrupt and uh, so we, we also know that last year they also tried to bribe people. Kyrgyzstan, um, in the first page, I didn't read, okay. Um, the first page of the presentation, I wrote like Kyrgyzstan is the democratic country, so-called island of democracy, but controversial. It's such a controversial country. Uh, this is, of course, not the full democracy uh, that we could say, because uh, sometimes elections are not that fair. Uh, sometimes, as Ken mentioned, uh, people can be like rebellions and be arrested just for demonstrating outside. Uh, but mainly, uh, comparing to other countries, we are much closer to more democratic countries. At the same time, we, we lacked uh, economic free. Uh, eco in, in, the, in the region, uh, probably in the economic policy perspective, we are one of the most liberal uh, countries. Uh, with regard to economic policies. Uh, the tax rates are lower. Uh, uh, the level of uh, state organizations, I don't know, interference with private businesses is lower than in, lo uh, in neighboring countries or the level of expropriation uh, is lo lower and uh, rating and other stuff. But, but it's not enough. Uh, I think currently this, for example, this last year and especially this last uh, six months, only because we have this democracy, uh, every day somebody is being jailed uh, and uh, this, uh, the issues of corruption and uh, the, uh, of this uh, state officials uh, are being one of the key topics. Not yet doing reforms. Uh, but at least, like we have this discussion and uh, trying to clean the society. 
uh, the the government's uh, official the, the government's policy, which also brings us to this corruption. So, I don't know whether our political freedom influences real economic reforms. Not yet. Any other questions? I just have a small question. Uh, of course, we are very happy to hear a lot of good developments in Kyrgyzstan, but I was uh, recently reading about the rays of uh, Islamic uh, uh, radicalist, ra radi radicals. Yeah? And how do you uh, ex uh, explain uh, this? Yeah, thank you. Uh, of course, this is another topic, but uh, probably it's interesting. Kyrgyzstan, the population of Kyrgyzstan, the majority uh, is Muslim, but the Kyrgyz people being nomads uh, in the past, like Mongols, this is like you, many people do not fully practice the religion. Uh, mainly they call themselves as like, yes, I'm Muslim, but it includes other ancient beliefs and traditions. So in that perspective, it's being very moderate uh, Islam. On the other hand, because the Soviet Union uh, didn't provide any uh, information and would forbid uh, any discussions about religion, people got thirsty after the independence and they went to religion. Uh, they tried to learn as much as they can and uh, that's why, especially the young people, they, they are like, becoming more and more uh, religious. But this also is, re is not about extreme uh, re religious part. And the third is uh, especially vulnerable people who see injustice uh, in the system. Uh, they are becoming more like, they have these extreme ideas. Uh, not that they wanted to, I don't know, to bomb something in Kyrgyzstan, but they went to Syria to fight. Like, uh, there are a few thousand of people uh, went from, from Kyrgyzstan too, but from any other country too, regretfully, from our side. Uh, I think currently, I would not say that uh, radical Islam is growing. I would say that Islam is growing uh, today. Um, there are different factors of it. Uh, and the active, uh, active relations with these uh, Islamic countries. Um, but I think what is saving Kyrgyzstan uh, is that Kyrgyzstan is the most uh, free, religiously free country in Central Asia. Only in Kyrgyzstan you can preach, uh, like you can go from one house to another, like in neighboring countries it is forbidden. That's why some religious people are becoming more radical in neighboring countries. Uh, the number of terrorist acts, uh, comparing like in Kyrgyzstan or comparing in neighboring countries, which are very strict, they have more policemen, more control, more intelligence officers. Kyrgyzstan is uh, really low. So I think maybe here Kyrgyzstan is saved uh, only because of having religious freedom. <laughs> Regretfully, we want to be the model for at least our neighboring countries, um, and we know that we will be, and uh, we know that probably very soon our people will be traveling in neighboring countries and teaching them how to build some democratic institutions, especially the institutions of civil society, because uh, the civil society in our country is really strong. Um, in terms of like religious freedom and others, we are not the real role model, I think. 
but uh, comparing in Central Asia, we are the best, maybe. Uh, so we hope we could teach in the beginning the region, uh, but their political systems are not changing. Their strict policies are not changing. There is one country like Turkmenistan, which is really another North Korea. Uh, so we don't know anything about them. Uh, we only have Turkmens who don't want to come back there, and they live with us. Um, uh, Uzbekistan, Mirziyoyev is a, as a new president, is becoming quite prominent, but only because they didn't have these uh, big reforms, they had very big restrictions. Now, every time when he releases a little bit, it, it makes a big uh, discussion and people say, oh, great. But we think that Uzbekistan, if, if the president or other president, if they can bring more freedom, it, this will be top one country in Central Asia. This will be the strongest country, uh, much stronger than Kazakhstan. Uh, and also, Uzbekistan's foreign policy is interesting. They are like moderate. They did, do not choose one country. like. Russia, they are much freer, so I hope like there is also there are also some expectations from Uzbekistan, but Uzbekistan still not free, uh, neither economically or politically. Tajikistan is also another uh, problematic uh, region, strong authoritarianism, bureaucracy, no reforms. So we are we are just waiting. Uh, maybe we should make our reforms fast, uh, so that tomorrow we could all focus on our neighboring countries. Uh, we have good friends in Tajikistan, Tajikistan Free Market Institute. So uh, our people at the, that institute are interested in replicating the open skies policy in Tajikistan. So maybe we will try. Okay, thank you. Thank you.